Hey there, welcome to another episode of Create or Die. This is your host, Ike Allred. And today, we're looking at episode 22. That's a big one. I know I've been saying that a lot, but uh, hey... We're well into double digits, well into the second decade of numbers, if you will. So, cool stuff. And if you're a fan of this podcast and it's uh, helped you out or brings you a little joy, you know, feel free to head on over to createordie.net and uh, pick yourself up a sticker or a piece of swag like this fine creator die school hat that i'm sporting um and you know if you don't want to throw any coin our way that's totally fine too uh what's probably even just as valuable or more valuable is is, uh you know telling your family telling your friends telling other creatives about what it is we're bringing you know it's our goal to kind of demystify this whole creative world whether professionally or just individually you know we're all creative we've talked about that before and for those of us in the the business if you will of creativity uh it's easy it's easy to to get shook a little shooken up you know so this podcast is designed to bring others on talk about some of the things we're struggling with some of the things we're passionate with or about i shouldn't talk about things we're passionate with probably anyways i digress today's episode is a little different i'm uh it's been a while since i've really kind of drafted a lot of content pre going live you know Um, in this episode I decided you know hey let's talk about storytelling and I had some ideas bounced around in my mind of what I would talk about I know that I'm by no means the expert of storytelling Um, but as a human as a creative I am a storyteller whether intentionally or not so that's what it's about and and storytelling let's just let's just jump right in storytelling is a key ingredient uh, in just about everything movies songs advertising art animation branding relationships politics etc and like I said earlier we all do it you know consciously or not so we might as well learn how to how to tell the important stories about ourselves or about the things we care about uh, really, really well, right? And this episode, again, is not meant to be an all-inclusive course on how to become an amazing storyteller. You know, sometimes I try to drop knowledge nugs, but they're few and far between from me (laughs) in this episode. Um, This is something that is a lifelong pursuit for me personally and i imagine for anybody even professional storytellers um but when we hear the word story at least at least i instinctively think that something has been made up if someone's telling you a story it's probably fictional right Um, or not true and I would argue that we should think differently about it now if we look story up on the Google and get a definition there's a few of them out there the one I liked is story a narrative either true or fictitious in prose or verse designed to interest amuse or instruct the hearer or reader 
So, essentially, storytelling puts you, puts me, in the driver's seat. You know, some areas of life that we might not realize where storytelling is being used is politics, like I mentioned. You know, political pundits use it to spin the facts into a narrative that support their agenda. Filmmakers use it to captivate their audience. Marketers use it to convince their target audience to purchase their product or service and not their competitors. And I think once we realize that everyone is telling a story in just about everything they do, and it's coming from their point of view or to serve their purposes, you can start to look at the world with your eyes open. Kind of like when Neo finally unplugs from the Matrix and sees the real world, this dystopian, scary, robot-run world is nothing like the fantasy that he was living. And to, to get the ball rolling, uh, one place where I feel like they've got the the market cornered pretty well on concise training on everything from all different angles of storytelling is Masterclass. Now, this is not sponsored by Masterclass. Um, if they want to send me some money, great. <laughs> but something that I've subscribed to uh, on and off again um, for several years and have gleaned an amazing amount of awesome, awesome tips, tricks, techniques, formulas for storytelling in all of its different forms. Um, and in preparing for this, uh, this little podcast episode, I decided to pull up Masterclass and do a couple searches, and I found that they had an article for anybody to look at to kind of tease you into subscribing. It's called Seven Storytelling Tips, How to Tell a Story Effectively. And I kind of reversed the order there. But uh, how to tell a story effectively, seven storytelling tips. Okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read these off. Listicle style. I don't think they're in any specific order. Um, and then I might comment about some of them, what, what it means to me. Uh, you know, if you Google that, you, you know, you'll find it. And you can read what Masterclass had to say about it. But I decided to use it as kind of a prompt for things uh, for me to expound on. So, number one on their list for how to tell a story effectively is choose a clear central message. So whether you're, you know, writing a screenplay for a movie or you're writing copy for a website or you're creating a video or a single design like a, a poster or a postcard or whatever, choose a clear central message. What is what is that key thing you're trying to get across or the call to action? And focus on that. Okay, number two, embrace conflict, which is something I personally try to avoid in my life. <laughs> I, I like to be uh, be friendly, be a peacemaker, keep things cool, but that makes for a pretty boring uh, story. So you you as the consumer of stories in all their various forms, we want to see some conflict there, you know. Um, in politics, obviously, you've got two major parties in the U.S. and and you know, like never before, we're butting heads, the two different sides, and that's what one of the things that uh, makes us tune into 24-hour news sources when you know used to be fine. We could pull up the news at. 10 o'clock and 
get what we needed to and we're, we were fine that's all we needed to hear or you could go even farther back and you had to go to the movie theater and get an update on what was happening with the war efforts during world war ii or whatever so um conflict is important you know it's obvious you, every good movie that we see you know it usually involves a protagonist that you fall in love with and you're rooting for but then they make a mistake or something happens to them that puts them in a pickle creates this conflict and then you'll do anything to see you're praying that the outcome will be rewarding at the end of that movie or the end of the book or whatever so you need conflict think about you know how can i get conflict in a poster or or an illustration um it's a little harder but i'm sure all you smart creatives out there can figure it out uh, number three have a clear structure so there's a lot of different ways this could go but um, one thing that comes to mind is you know uh, and this involves the previous uh, or the first one too a clear message have a clear structure you've got to communicate when it comes to design you know it's easy to think oh as long as it looks cool then okay it must be good design but no not the case you know if, if that design doesn't communicate clearly then it's a failure you know so it can be as cool as can be but if it doesn't communicate it's a failure and clear structure is going to help with that and we could you know talk about the other forms of storytelling and and how that applies um but there you go number three number four mine your personal experiences wow so i've talked about this before like to be a good creative we can't just sit in front of the computer or behind a sketchbook and not live life because then what it is we're creating is bound to be empty shallow without soul if you will so those personal experiences whether whether you're going to tell something about yourself and you're telling your own story and you're leveraging those personal experiences and presenting them in a clear way that introduces conflict and you know all the things or you're just you remember what it felt like to be yelled at by your football coach and to have them grabbing your face mask and you could feel the spittle hitting against your face and you you can imagine yourself blinking and how uncomfortable that is as a high school kid or whatever and how you leverage that experience in some other conflict in in a movie that you're producing or a story that you're writing you know it may not be the player coach dynamic could be the alien versus the alien hunter scenario or a million other things you know mine your personal experiences and, and maybe that's not the best example but um that's one experience that came to mind number five engage your audience so you've got to find a way to make what it is that you're presenting uh interesting and depending on the vehicle that you're telling the story through a podcast a uh, novel uh, website design there are different levers that you can pull to 
engage your audience. You know, on a website, it may be some interaction, interactive element that brings, that engages the audience to want to dig into your story more. And it can't just be something that's cool. It has to be something that actually communicates and complements the brand and speaks to that audience or else you're not going to engage them right um with a movie you know it might be the music uh is so loud and all-encompassing that you can't help but know just by what type of music you're hearing that something crazy is about to happen you know so there you go number five we got two more two more hang in there these are good number six observe good storytellers so obviously that might be someone in real life you know maybe it's a colleague at work a boss an executive that you look up to and when they get up on stage or in front of people uh, they just know how to captivate and tell their story and and make those people their audience feel what it is that they want them to feel um, I, I can definitely think of a few really good examples at, uh, at MX where I work um, or it can be people that you don't know personally you know maybe it's a designer that you look up to you follow on the socials and the way that they frame their layouts and uh, the type that they choose to convey and communicate just is always spot on or you're observing good storytelling by reading your favorite author's work or watching movies from your favorite uh, filmmaker and so on and so on number six okay number seven number seven and again these are in no order so this isn't meant to be the most amazing one of all but uh, narrow the scope of your story okay so it's easy to go off on tangents and want to um, paint a picture of this entire world that's something I fall into when I'm creating like tutorials for YouTube on blender for example I I haven't done a good job at saying okay this is my audience it's a intermediate blender user so I don't need to talk about what exactly this tool does or that tool and then I lose them on this story on how to create this thing or um, render this amazing piece or, or whatever so yeah narrow the scope of your story and lots of good ways to apply that so there you go there's the seven storytelling tips from masterclass again highly recommend masterclass you know subscribe for a year i think they do it in yearly chunks they may have monthly options available now but uh well well worth the 200 bucks or whatever for a year um some of the courses that touch on storytelling that were real impactful from for me was uh neil gaiman who is the writer of sandman and you know creator writer of many comic books and which have become movies or films or which is basically the same thing movies or tv shows um he had some great tips for those who don't consider themselves a writer or a storyteller on how to come up with a good idea so one tip that i've leveraged from time to time or a couple of times i guess that he mentioned was 
taking an old story like Hans Christian Andersen or a grim fairy tale or some or something from the Bible or something just that is really old and think of a way to uh, use that as as kind of the template for your new story so an example of a story that I started to uh, play with was Little Red Riding Hood and I started creating little character designs and um, little illustrations of what it might look like if Little Red Riding Hood was actually a s astronaut or you know space heroine of some sort and that she was maybe you know flying some supply ship to the older woman character that represented her grandma who is maybe you know run some some outpost somewhere and then the wolf is instead some alien that you know gets in the mix of things and you know we can still use some of those elements without calling it red riding hood in space you can still use some of those elements like maybe there's you know she's wearing a red spacesuit or the alien even though it's definitely not a wolf it has some of the form language of a wolf you know and so forth so it's a fun one to play with so if you haven't tried that give it a try ron howard we all know ron howard right opie <laughs> uh the andy griffith show uh ron howard the director of willow um yeah, Cocoon, I believe, which scared the living crap out of me as a kid. I don't know why, just did not like them aliens. But obviously an amazing storyteller in his own right. And I believe it was him who talked about story beats, which I'm going to go into a little deeper in a moment here. But essentially that a good movie is a handful a certain number of story beats that are just kind of connected together and that's the really rough formula for a good movie um james patterson writer i believe he write the uh books on uh with tom hanks I forget what it's called. Anyways, some good stuff there. Werner Herzog. You might recognize him from The Mandalorian. He he played a character, uh, I believe the, f the first kind of bad guy who had a bounty on Grogu and wanted, you know, or Baby Yoda. So, you know, he's an actor. He's a filmmaker, both um, narrative or f fictitious but I think he's known more for his work uh, in documentary filmmaking so anyways just a few of the amazing uh, masters on master class so check that action out for sure so like I said story beats and this is something that I, I didn't have a name for it but I had fun doing it, whether I knew what I was doing or not, essentially. But once I heard Ron Howard's uh, kind of breakdown of story beats and, and what they are, it really came to life for me. And, and it can be uh, a lot of different things. So could be something where you get an idea of uh, a scene or just some kind of circumstance you know a, a nun and a rabbi and a preacher walked into a bar i mean that's a that's a story beat and something something funny or crazy happens okay i don't know how that relates to this big story that i'm gonna, gonna tell this this entire novel or movie 
but it's just a funny little anecdote or story beat, if you will. So that can be written. You can write it down. Um, like J.K. Rowling, I, I hear, I believe, I, I don't know if it was a documentary or something I read where uh, they were talking about how J.K. had a box where, you know, as she was thinking about what to write or maybe she had started writing and I don't remember the order, but she would get an idea for like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if there were there was a chocolate frog that was actually alive or or could uh, hop around okay we'll write that down on a little piece of paper put it in the shoebox or an in invisibility cloak imagine what you could do with an invisibility cloak okay I'm gonna write that down put it in the shoebox and she had thousands of those and so as she was sitting down to write the Harry Potter book, she would kind of thumb through those and, and see if it jogged any ideas of like, oh, I could, you know, I could use this uh, invisibility cloak and that'll help me with kind of this problem with the narrative that I'm working on or whatever. I don't pretend to know what goes on in J.K. Rowling's mind, but... Uh, she uh, she did use this, whether she knew it or not, <laughs> these story beats. The way I like to use story beats, and I think others as well, is like if I'm starting to think about uh, a story that I want to tell, a cartoon, and I've come up with a handful of characters, the, the one I'm thinking of now is this kind of red-haired goofy Mr. Bean type character, this Irish guy who just is kind of clueless and does some crazy things and some of the crazy adventures he would get into. So I, I created a handful of these characters and then what I would do rather than just start with storyboard one and work my way linearly down through the, uh, the narrative or the pretend uh, show that I was hoping to make or whatever I would just start doodling on a piece of paper or on my iPad of like what are some funny scenarios that this guy could get into you know um, let's say he's camping you know what what are some crazy things that could befall someone while camping and I would draw little doodles of, you know, bees attacking him, or he's trying to set up his tent, and it's it's a mess. And you might say some of these things are cliche, and, and yeah, they probably are. But if done right, I think it can endear the, uh, the audience to what it is I'm trying to create. There's got to be plenty of new stuff in there as well, and you can't try to hang your hat on one of these kind of slapstick story beats but it can uh, get the mind going. And so after filling up a page or two of these, then, I, then I'll start to kind of cut these out and put them in order. Like, okay, he gets to the campsite, he builds a fire, and then he builds his tent, and then he goes looking for more firewood, runs into a bee's nest. Um, he's sleeping in his crumpled tent, ends up, in the middle of the lake and, and you're putting these things into order to where it becomes kind of a funny scenario and like Ron Howard said it's essentially this certain number of story beats strung together in an interesting way using those other tips that Masterclass talked about creating conflict and other things uh, to put together a cool story so that's something that's it's worked for me and not and not just for pretend hopeful future animated series this is that I might create but for real things like work projects at work like like a website design or a presentation you know 
that I need to create. And I know that I want to have some cool graph and I know I want some wow image or um, whatever. Those things can be kind of doodled out or thumbnailed. And then you, as you're putting together your outline, you're like, oh, that's where I can use that cool graph concept or outline. And I pick pretty much the most boring thing to many creatives, that of PowerPoint or Google Slides. But don't let the tool get you down. I think I've said it before, you can you can create amazing stuff with the crappiest of tools, so treat it with respect. You're still, it's coming from you, whether you're telling the story through Illustrator or After Effects or PowerPoint. Okay. So, let's dive into, you know, because, heck, let's just keep on going. This is fun. Uh, how might one use storytelling in film and animation? Well, I think we've touched on it a little bit, but while we're on the subject, I came across a TikTok recently uh, with Guillermo del Toro, and he was talking about animation and how everything is so frantic and it's been boiled down to a simple formula for how things are done. You know, you've got your cool character with one eyebrow raised, leaning up against the side of the building, and everything's been boiled down into like a hundred different emojis that can, that are put in a different order, and uh, the character design is slightly changed, but not too far, and that's 90, 99% of what's out there, in Mr. Del Toro's opinion. You know, fast camera moves. You got the SpongeBob cuts where you can't have uh, a, a scene any longer than 10 seconds or whatever. And as you probably know, he recently directed uh, a new adaption of Pinocchio uh, for Netflix, and it was stop motion. And while he was directing this he directed his animators his puppeteers whatever you want to call them to slow things down you know for example when a character is talking don't just show that character talking but rather spend more time focusing on the character that is listening and how that and what it looks like as that character processes the information, processes the information that's being said, um, that that can be really powerful in in getting your audience to feel. And Guillermo argues that animation is not just for kids. You know, it can be a powerful storytelling vehicle for so many different subjects and and audiences. So thought that was a cool kind of anecdote there but obviously storytelling with film and animation you think storytelling you've got obviously screenplay but from a artist's perspective uh, I think storyboards something I do a lot of and always am looking for excuses to do more of because I, f I enjoy it and I find them useful and it's interesting to find out that not all filmmakers leverage story storyboarding. You know, obviously, when creating an animated, and maybe it's not obvious to some people, but when you're creating an animated uh, film or short or whatever, it's really expensive and time-consuming to create those animations, those finished animations and it used to be that everything was hand drawn you know one piece of paper at a time and there would be you know five million drawings for your average uh, Disney full-length film or whatever and so it was definitely frowned upon and people would probably get 
drawn and quartered if they were to cut something that had been fully animated. And so that's why storyboarding is so important because you can do little quick thumbnails and stitch it together, use scratch audio, present it to your colleagues, your test audience, your stakeholders, whoever. And if the story is coming through in storyboard form, then you know it's just going to get better and better as you trust the process and go from storyboarding to rough animation to polished animation to effects and sound design and everything. Not necessarily in, the, in that order. So definitely animation is key. Uh, even live action where there's you know heavy effects are necessary. You want to storyboard that crap out because basically, excuse me, that's animation. Um, but, oh, and then the one other scenario where I think people should definitely use the storyboard is if, if you're doing live action, but you've only got a super limited window to, to film, you know, uh, you've got to be in and out of this location because the lighting is a certain way or your budget just doesn't allow you to have all of these actors and film crew on site for very long so you gotta you've got your shot list whether it's written or storyboarded and you're just capturing that stuff so but there are a lot of filmmakers that prefer to not do any storyboarding at all you know and i think uh i think i heard steven spielberg is is one who just really likes to let the location I know he's had plenty of movies where he's used storyboards I don't know if it was his decision or someone else's but anyways you know you go to a location and you let that location speak to you it's like I'm here it's part of the art form what story is this location trying to tell how do I how do I use this location as a storytelling element as a character if you will, what kind of shots, what angles, um, and and then a lot of the storytelling ends up happening in in the editing room because you've captured all of this different footage, and as you're going through and editing that, you're like, okay, I know I had a shot like this. Let's pull it together, and then surprises might happen. Oh, I didn't look at it this way, and so yeah. There I go, pretending to be an expert on filmmaking, which, again, I'm not. Just throwing out some some tips and some places to go look. And if something, you know, triggers your fancy, then go to YouTube, go to Masterclass, go to someone you know who does that thing and learn more about it, right? And so, I think we've talked about this a little bit, but uh, when it comes to design, so a lot of people who listen or watch this podcast are designers, um, because that's who my audience is, mostly. <laughs> um, I think... Again, I'll go back to, and I think I said this earlier, but the most important part of design, the most critical way of leveraging storytelling is ensuring that you're communicating clearly. And so to do that, you gotta know your audience. You gotta know what it is you're trying to say. You gotta get crystal clear about what what is it we want our audience to do um, what's the call to action what is the purpose you know and not only knowing our audience but but a lot of times design is representing yourself or a brand 
And so you need to ensure that you're communicating that brand effectively and what it is that it stands for and that everything that you do is reinforcing your brand values, your brand promise. And I'll be the first to admit that, you know, when you're in a hurry, you've got an hour to create an ad for, you know, LinkedIn. And it seems like super simple, quick thing. And you've done it a hundred times before and you just phone it in and you may, may not think about these things. And you might think, I'm trying to have fun with this. I want to throw some extra graphical design elements in the background. I like this, I like the way this person looks. I'm going to use that stock photography. That other person just bugs me. But you're not really thinking qualitatively like, who am I speaking to? Who is my audience? It's not about me and what I like or don't like. It's about what's going to connect with that person on the other side of the screen, on the other side of the transaction. And so just because it's cool or it employs the latest and greatest in graphic design techniques or motion design wizardry, doesn't matter. It's got to communicate. And speaking of motion design, that's something where like animation, it it is a different form of animation. It's uh, it's easy to want to overdo it because you think, you know, I can't just fade this simple sans serif font onto the screen. You know, I want it to bounce in and ease and turn and slide and flip, and I want it to have a gradient wipe or whatever and so you say let's just add all of it let's just add it all on there i remember um i had a motion designer that uh was on my team once upon a time who came to me with this cool button design that he had created for something and it literally felt like i mean this guy's talented so don't want to take anything away from him but he fell into the trap of more is more let's just do everything when in reality that distracted from the message it wasn't on brand it didn't communicate it yeah wasn't right for the audience and so we had to pull it back and go simple you know that's easy to do with titling animation like i started to talk about sometimes it's just you just simple fade opacity fade in maybe a little scaling or something and that seems boring and there are more elegant ways to do it Uh, but you got to make sure whatever it is you're doing you're not distracting or sending the wrong message because if you've got a, a bouncy font coming in but you're trying to be serious and sophisticated it's going to send a schizophrenic message and you're going to lose the person and they might not know why that you know piece of content didn't resonate with them but there you go that's just some of my thoughts here on a late tuesday early early wednesday that uh came my way when thinking about storytelling. So I hope if nothing else, you thought of some things that you disagree with and then, you know, drop them in the comments, shoot me an email, message me, hit me up on LinkedIn, whatever. Love to hear it. You know, I think this is a topic that we can never cover enough, honestly. And I think that there are a lot of guests that I can invite on the program who are much more qualified than myself to talk on this subject and I plan to do that but uh, this this is just you know we'll throw it out there see what sticks 
type of episode. So let me know. Is this, uh, is this helpful? Is this uh, the type of episode that, that you enjoyed? Uh, you want more of it? Are there other subjects I can uh, butcher for you? Happy to do. I got no shame. I got no shame. <laughs> Anyways, my friends, keep on creating. And until next time, create or die. <laughs>